You're listening to the Life with Old Dogs podcast, and I'm your host, Dawn Memna, primary caretaker of all of our wonderful senior German Shepherds, right here at Woody's Place Senior German Shepherd Sanctuary. Hey, folks, welcome back to the Life with Old Dogs podcast. So this week, uh, we're season seven, episode five, and this episode is called From Kitchen to the Bowl, which I love. (laughs) Um, Why home cooking, I feel, is best for your your older dog or dog in general and how to do it correctly. Um, So let me just start off by saying that um, I feel that more people are jumping on the um, the real food, whole food bandwagon for their dogs. And I I hope it's not a trend. I hope more people are uh, sitting up and taking notice to the fact that we have the highest rate ever of canine cancer and autoimmune disease and dogs dying at an early, early age than ever in history. And I truly believe there is a direct correlation between this species inappropriate diet that we have been feeding our dogs, and that's kibble. They were not designed to eat crunchy little chunks of whatever it may be from a bag. Um, And I get that it's convenient, and uh, believe me when I say, and I've said it before, I've, I've not made it a secret, that I do use kibble also. Um, I try to do like an 80-20 split where, you know, maybe 80% of the time I'm home cooking, 20% of the time I'm giving them kibble with maybe canned or kibble with whole um, whole food on top, real whole food on top. Um, something along those lines. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. I get that. But I I make a concerted effort to make sure that most of the time they are eating real whole food uh, because it's important to me that I keep them in tip top shape for as long as possible. So um, I'm, I'm a mom. My kids are all older now. They're all out on their own with kids on their own. And when my kids were little, uh, I was running a business. I was a college student back then. I'm like a lifelong college student. <laughs> and um you know, sometimes uh, life was a little more hectic than others with, uh, you know, school and school sports and, you know, um, club sports and houses to clean and, you know, kids going in all different directions and kids with friends over and you get the picture. Um, and sometimes, you know, it was hard. Um, I tried to make sure that they ate well. I, I'm a firm believer in in cooking from scratch. I, I did it back then. That's what my mom taught me. That's what I do. But sometimes, you know what? We were eating we were eating hot dogs and macaroni and cheese out of a box and canned applesauce because <laughs> that's life and it happens. So that's <clears throat> how I kind of look at the kibble. Like uh, if I literally just don't have the time, don't have the energy or whatever, it's kibble with home cooked or, you know, canned on top. But it it doesn't that doesn't happen often. (laughs) So um, I notice more people are paying attention to this, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Um, Really, your, your dog needs it. Your dog needs real whole food. Okay. Again, because, because the kibble in the bag is not species appropriate. And I feel it has a direct correlation to the uh, ridiculous rates of cancer, canine cancer, autoimmune diseases, and early deaths that we are experiencing like we never have before. Okay, so one of the biggest benefits that you get from home cooking for your dog, aside from the fact that it makes you feel good, it really does. I mean, I, I, I never view it as a chore. I love doing it because it makes me feel good knowing that I'm giving them what they need to live their best life and to fight off diseases that are just knocking on their door, unfortunately, because they're old dogs. Um, But one of the biggest benefits about home cooking for your dog is clearly improving um, their nutrition. 
All right. Like I said, again, gives them the tools. First of all, they feel good. And then it gives them the tools to fight off whatever may be, um, may be coming their way. Um, so that that's it right there, first and foremost. Second thing is if you have a dog with allergies, um, you know, maybe they have hot spots. And, and older dogs, you know, tend to have food sensitivities and, and get hot spots and paw licking and ear problems and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> home cooking for them can give you the advantage of knowing exactly what you're putting in your dog's diet. So if there is a problem, you can figure it out, okay, by by like limiting the ingredients um, and, and backing them up one by one until you can determine, oh, okay, it's the chicken that's making making this dog do that because he's not doing it when I give him beef for a week or two, but he is doing it when I give him chicken and then you eliminate the chicken. So um, that right there in and of itself to me is, is a big win uh, also. So um, the other thing is just the sheer joy that they get out of having something that they truly want. I mean, I don't know too many dogs who get all amped up <laughs> over, you know, overcooked, whatever it is, crunchy little balls. I have a friend who, you know, that's what she calls her dog's dog food, her dog's crunchies. It's like, that sounds cute, but that's terrible. Like, I don't want to eat crunchies all the time. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and the dogs don't either. I mean, they want variety. They need variety. Uh, it just, it's mind blowing to me when I meet someone who is giving their dog kibble and they've given that dog kibble from the first day they brought him home. And now that dog is, you know, six, seven, eight years old with health issues and they've never changed the food once. It is mind blowing to me. Okay, it, it, that is just so, I mean, does that even make sense? It shouldn't. But but the marketers for the big conglomerate food companies have us convinced that that one bag will provide all the nutrients our dog needs throughout every stage of its life. That is just mind-boggling to me because common sense dictates Hey, eggs are good for us, but we don't eat eggs every stinking meal, every day, every week, every month, every year of our lives and expect us to be running at an optimum level, right? Nope. All right. Getting off that soapbox now. <laughs> okay. Dogs require six essential nutrients in their diet. Protein. That's high quality protein. You know, you won't be giving them hot dogs or bologna or anything like that. Um, it's technically a protein, but it's not a good protein. It's like a byproduct in a bag of kibble. You don't want to do that. Complex carbohydrates. Okay. I'm not talking simple carbohydrates. It's complex carbohydrates like, you know, high quality vegetables and fruits and um, even some grains, you know, quinoa, uh, buckwheat, um, oats, stuff like that. Uh, healthy fats, all right, um, and I'm not talking like canola oil, but I'll get into that. Healthy fats, vitamins, minerals, and water. And <clears throat> I just want to touch base on the water because, you know, that's something else that can be overlooked that, you know, just like the kibble, we get conditioned to believe a certain thing and never question it because it's what we've done our whole lives. But especially in today's day and age, you know, just because the water comes out of the faucet doesn't mean it's good water. We need to be <clears throat> responsible not only for our dogs because they're drinking water all the time, but for us, for our families, we need to have our water tested. It's not that expensive. You can order a test online, send it away and get the results back and it'll tell you whether there are impurities in there or, you know, just things that should not be in there that are really bad for you, like radon, and um, and address it, all right? Um, and you can address it by, you know, either a whole home filter or even a filter on your, your spigot. Um, and if that doesn't work, you can, you know, buy bottled water, which I'm not an advocate of, but you can do that too. Um, so water, nutrient that's often overlooked and really shouldn't be. All right, but those those six essential nutrients are vital 
um, to our dog's overall being, especially our older dogs. You know, it, it promotes uh, muscle growth and repair, um, gives them energy, um, <clears throat> protects their organs, helps with their eyesight, um, helps regulate their body functions, and, uh, you know, is good for their teeth and their bones um, and helps keep our dogs hydrated. So they need all of those six nutrients met regularly, all right? And it should be from different sources, not from one source over and over again. You know, and as I was saying, older dogs, their nutritional needs are um, different than a younger dog or a puppy. Um, For a long time, there was this belief that protein should be cut back for older dogs. And now studies have found that this is not true, um, that they they need to be provided with a high, um, high quality, lean protein, such as, uh, you know, beef um, chicken, turkey. And when I say beef, I mean like a 90, 10, I don't mean like a, you know, 75, 25. And it's like, eesh. yeah, you don't want that. Um, uh, but you know, the high quality protein, um, it helps them with muscle repair and, um, you know, because that starts to break down as, as they get older, the complex carbohydrates, um, they need they they benefit from um from more fiber in their diet because their digestive system starts to age and change as they get older um and they may be um subject to bouts of diarrhea and constipation and things along those lines so of course there's there's fiber in um in fruits and vegetables i mean just think of pumpkin alone Oftentimes, if your dog has diarrhea or constipation and you call the vet, they they will suggest, you know, hey, have you tried adding pumpkin to their diet? Because, you know, that'll like push through, plump things up and and push through what needs to be pushed through and, you know, kind of regulate the digestive system in a natural um unintrusive way. So complex carbohydrates, aside from the vitamins and minerals, it's that, that added fiber is, is beneficial to older dogs. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if they have, and we want this, um, a good gut microbiome that is going to help their whole overall immune system again, which is what we want because they're older and they need that added support and that we need them running at an optimum level once again to fight off any sort of disease that may be knocking on their door. All right. And the healthy fats, I mean, come on, we all need that. Like us too, right? I mean, a lot of this could be applied to us as well. But um, healthy fats, omega-3 uh, fatty acids, essential fatty acids, um, they're great for for joint health, um, inflammation, which a lot of older dogs have, um, and they need that. They need that. Another thing is too, which I haven't really added in here, are um, herbs. And I, I'm big on herbs for dogs, um, for the Woody's Place dogs here. I have um, I have a, a grow tent here at the sanctuary where I I store my um, herbs, my plants um, throughout the winter months. Now it's nice. So they're actually out in my greenhouse and right out here all on my back patio. Uh, I literally have like, I don't know, six or seven different herbs growing, including term, um, term, turmeric, turmeric um, which is fantastic for, uh, you know, inflammation and, and joint health and stuff like that for the residents here and me and Mr. Woody's place. <laughs> All right, moving on. So choosing quality ingredients for home cooking. So you're doing this because you want what's best for your older dog. So I I would not like, I don't, I shouldn't say. I don't run to like, I don't run to like Walmart <laughs> and buy the meat there or, or whatnot because um, it's, it's typically 
grain fed beef that's there. It's probably loaded with antibiotics and hormones. It's not good for us and it's not good for our dog. So you want to choose a higher quality meat source. Um, we have a lot of farms around here. So fresh meat is not, you know, hard to come by. Um, I actually buy meat <laughs> from Wyoming. <laughs> um, there's a company out there that um, I'm very familiar with the family. And I know that the cattle is grass fed, grass finished, which is premium quality beef. Um, I can even get uh, organ meat for us and for the dogs, which is phenomenal. And um, I I love that. It's 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 expensive just because I have to have it shipped here. But um, <clears throat> someday I hope I hope to be out there and I can just go buy it from them because um it's that important to me. Uh, same with chicken. Same with any sort of poultry or fish or whatever. Try to know the source that you're buying it from, um, not only for your dog, but for you too. I would, I would think that if you're, you're trying to home cook for your dog, that you would want, you, or you already are doing this for yourself as well. So high quality protein source. Um, the fruits and vegetables, any fruits and vegetables or grain that you're going to use, um, I would encourage you to make sure that it's organic. Um, or, you know, not loaded with pesticides and herbicides and stuff like that. Um, because, again, you know, why are you doing this? You're doing this because you want your older dog to be as healthy as possible. And, you know, what's more deceiving than a bag of kibble it is going to the grocery store and seeing this beautiful, shiny, bright, apple, bright red apple, and it's huge, and it's perfect, and it's just covered in this wax substance, and there's not a blemish on it because it's just loaded with pesticides and stuff like that, right? That is so deceitful in my mind. I mean, that is like the ultimate deception to me, something that we need as a, as a human species, and it's loaded with all this cancer-causing stuff to, just to make it more marketable. Um, little story about that. Uh, so we have apple trees and years ago I had somebody over a friend of mine from, uh, the lower part of Pennsylvania out of the Philadelphia area. And they came up and we were picking apples. And I can tell you right now, if you've never been in an apple orchard, apples aren't perfect. Okay. They're, they're misshapen. They're, they're kind of on the smaller side, um, there are wormholes in them and stuff like that. So this particular person was out picking apples with me and I was just kind of eating like as I went along and she looked at me and she said, are these really um, good to eat? And I, I just laughed and I said to her, what, as opposed to that crap you get at Walmart? I said, yeah, this is like what produce looks like when it's not all polished up and shiny and they're trying to get as you know much money for it as they can, you got a round wormhole. <laughs> I mean, I've done it. I've like, I'm a country girl. I've like literally bit around a wormhole. It's not a big deal. Um, and there's nothing better than a ripe, juicy, all natural apple right from the tree when it's ready to be eaten. It may not look beautiful, but I'm getting everything I need out of it. So are the dogs. I mean, I've literally dropped apples on the ground and, you know, our chickens or goats eat them, you know, right off the tree. <laughs> so it's all good. Now they're soapbox. Anyway, good quality ingredients, fats. You want healthy fats as well. So if you're, you're getting salmon oil or green-lipped mussel or something along those lines, you want to make sure you want to know where it's coming from. You want to make sure it's sustain, sustainably sourced and not loaded with a bunch of toxins um, in a capsule that now you're giving to your dog, right? So quality ingredients. All right, so we got proteins, <clears throat> complex carbohydrates, and healthy fats. But how do you know how much to give? That seems to be the the most complex question for most. And when I when I talk with people about home cooking for their dog, that seems to be the most overwhelming part. Like 
I don't know what I can give my dog. I don't know what I can't give my dog. I don't know how much to give of this or how much to give of that. And what happens if, if it doesn't work out? What do I do then? I don't want to make my dog sick. I get that. I totally get that. But listen, folks, it's like us. It's like if you have kids or, you know, if you, you have kids now or if, you know, you're you're an older mom like me and all your kids are out of the house. <clears throat> you have to learn what you can about basic nutrients and what our bodies require. And then when you go to cook for your kids or yourself and now your dogs, you have to, you're not you're not trying to balance every single meal. That would drive you nuts, right? I mean, who wants to do that? That would be like doing algebra every day. <laughs> like That's like, ugh. that's like getting a tooth pulled or a root canal. No, thank you. So I get it. We don't have enough hours in the day to sit there and scratch our heads and figure out like how much of this needs to go in and how much of that needs to go in. And, you know, what if I'm putting too much of this in? So Every meal for your dog does not have to be perfectly nutritionally balanced. So please just stop that. Stop that. I talked about it on one of the other podcast episodes about these influencers on social media. And, you know, my gosh, if every meal is not perfectly balanced, it's just going to destroy your dog. Not true. It doesn't destroy you. It doesn't destroy me. It doesn't destroy our kids. It's not going to destroy our dogs. But. With that being said, you do want to aim for having their nutritional needs met, like within a week's time frame, okay? Um, and so how do you go about doing that? It's really not that complicated. So for an older dog, this is for an older dog, an older, you know, older dog, you want approximately 60% of protein. In, in their meal. Let's just say it's dinner. So you want 60% of protein in that meal. 10% 10, 10 of that should be organ meat, okay? And actually, I'm going to break that down a little bit further. Of that 60% of protein, 10% should be organ meat. Of that 10%, 5% should be secreting organ meat, and 5% should be non-secreting organ meat, okay? So what is secreting organ meat? All right, secreting organ meat is liver and kidneys, okay? That's secreting organ meat. Non-secreting organ meat is like lungs and heart and, and gizzards and tripe, which is smelly, <laughs> but that's non-secreting organ meat, All right? So you, you want to aim for that. Again, if you don't get it in every single time, that's okay, but you, you want to aim for that. All right, so, and I'll, I'll put this in the show notes, 60% protein for an older dog, high quality lean protein, of which 10% should be organ uh, meat, of that 10%, 5 should be secreting organ meat, 5% should be non-secreting organ meat. And again, I'll make sure this is in the show notes. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so 10% of the meal should be fat. Okay, now you have to take into consideration maybe there's fat in the meat. I'm not really sure, you know, what percentage you're using, but you do need 10% of a healthy fat in there. I mean, you can even put coconut oil in or <laughs> something that simple, salmon oil, a um, couple of sardines, you know. It, again, it doesn't have to be like precise every single time, but but you do want to use healthy healthy fats. I'm sorry. Um, you, you don't want to be using like, um, corn oil or grapeseed oil. Grapes are bad for dogs. So you don't want to use that or canola oil. Um, you could put some seeds in there like, um, uh, let's see, like hemp seed or pumpkin seed or sunflower seed or even chai seed. That, that, um, is healthy fat as well. Um, so you can mix it up a little bit. And again, it doesn't have to be precise. I do not go around, you know, measuring like everything. I'm kind of a dumper. Like these guys get chai seeds. They get pumpkin seed. Um, they get sunflower seeds <clears throat> without the shell, of course. And I'll just like sprinkle a few on top. I just kind of eyeball it. Like I don't go dousing, <laughs> you know, but I, I put a little bit on top. Um, 
coconut oil. That's another healthy fat, medium chain triglyceride fat. Um, they'll get it in, uh, sometimes I'll just put it right in their food, a little bit right in their food. Um, other times I'm giving, I'm making um, golden paste for them, which is uh, turmeric, uh, black pepper, and coconut oil, which is fantastic, uh, anti-inflammatory all natural anti-inflammatory and helps with their joints and stuff like that. So that there's healthy fats in that. Um, so, so there's, there's different sources and you want to mix it up a little bit. You don't want to constantly just be giving them coconut oil or chai seeds or something along those lines. You want to mix it up, but 10% of their meal should be a healthy fat. 30% of their meal and these are just kind of guidelines. Like these can fluctuate a little bit, the 60%, the 10% or whatever. But 30% should be complex carbohydrates, not simple carbohydrates, right? We're not cooking up like a box of, you know, Walmart brand macaroni and putting in their food and calling it good. Nope. Not that. We want complex carbohydrates. And again, um, these are fruits, healthy fruits, healthy vegetables, and healthy grains. We don't we don't want starchy vegetables. I, I kind of avoid peas like the plague. Um, for some reason, I've had <clears throat> excuse me more Woody's Place residents here who have reactions to peas, probably because there's so much pea product in kibble, um, which is what they've had most of their lives until they get here to the sanctuary. That if I, I even attempt to put peas in like home cooked food. I end up with itchy ears, licking paws, hot spots, stuff like that. And we have we have two residents here right now who have had skin problems long before they came to the sanctuary. Um, but I always have to really pay attention to what I'm giving them to keep them in check. It's Atticus and Brutus. Um, they both have black skin disease, you know, where they're missing hair. Um, poor Atticus is, you know, you can see his little butt cheeks because he has no hair back there and a big patch on his side. The hair never grew back. And Brutus here is the same way. He's got like some black spots on his tummy and a spot here on his face. And, you know, I do the best I can, but <clears throat> the damage is done with uh, black skin disease. So peas, starchy vegetable, it's a big no-no. I, I don't do it. But um, the complex carbohydrates, I, I really like um, things like spinach, broccoli, asparagus, celery, carrots. Um, I'll use green beans too. Um, apples, blueberries, pears, they like watermelon. I'll give them watermelon, uh, raspberries. We actually have um, blackberry bushes here around the property. They don't, they won't eat them, but I'll, I'll put them in their food and they don't know they're in there. So <laughs> that's good for them. Fiber, vitamins, nutrients, uh, antioxidants, all the good stuff. Um, so sweet potatoes, I, I do use sweet potatoes, even though it's, it's starchy and I don't, I stay away from potatoes, but <clears throat> that's not true. Occasionally they'll get sweet potatoes or potatoes, um, sweet potatoes, they're starchy, but I, I still provide them to the Woody's Place dogs on like a semi-regular basis. They all do good with sweet potatoes. And of course, that gives them fiber as well and vitamins and nutrients that they need. And I just, you know, they like it. So, um, but it's in moderation. It's in moderation. Okay. So 60% protein, 10% healthy fats and 30% complex carbohydrates. Oh, I'm sorry, the grains um, mixed in there with the complex carbohydrates. So uh, I, I will do brown rice from time to time or like a long grain rice or something like that. That is not really my go-to. I don't do white rice at all. Um, there's nothing wrong with brown rice, but when it comes down to calories, there are grains that are more nutrient dense, um, like quinoa is a big one. I love quinoa. I grow it here <laughs> at the sanctuary. Um, so um, quinoa, that's a that's a, a good good um, good grain for the dogs. Um, barley, buckwheat, or just oats. That's another good one. Um, but again, you know, you need to make sure that they're not, you know, you need to know where they're coming from. You want to make sure that, that, that it's a, a healthy, um, 
reliable source that you're buying them from and they're not loaded with, you know, herbicides, pesticides, all that, all that fun stuff. Okay. Other uh, powerhouse um, proteins and, and healthy fat sources that I use regularly are sustain- sustainably sourced sardines. Um, they usually already have the skin off and they're deboned and I know they're organic. Um, and I always get them packed in water. Uh, somebody at the store, my local mom pop store here likes them packed in water too. So sometimes I have to buy them. Um, and they're packed in oil and I come back to the sanctuary and I run them under water for a while <laughs> to try to get the oil off of them. Cause I just don't know what kind of oil it is. Um, and, and another, uh, powerhouse, um, powerhouse nutrient dense, uh, healthy fat protein source is, um, farm fresh eggs. So if you follow along with Woody's Place social media, I'm sure at some point you have seen um, video or picture of our uh, chicken and duck flock here. We have goats as well. Um, So we do have like a, it's called Three Acre Ranch. (laughs) Um, It's our little homestead here. My little homestead, really, Mr. Woody's Place probably thinks I'm nuts. Like I don't have enough to do. (laughs) Um, But I, I am just a nut job about, healthy organic food and i'm i'm really very anal about knowing where my food comes for me but then also for uh, mr woody's place and the residents um for instance i was in the store last week i don't go to the grocery store regularly but when i do like i don't know everything's just so bright and shiny and just kind of like beckons me (laughs) you know like Um, For some reason, like I go there with my list and all of a sudden, you know, Tate's thin chocolate chip cookies are like calling my name and I put them in the cart and I'm like, oh, they look so good. And my mouth is watering. And then just reality sinks in like two aisles over. And I'm like, I don't know where the flour comes for this. And I don't know where the eggs come for this. And and then I just get really weird. And the next thing I know, I'm walking two aisles back over to put the the cookies back because I want chocolate chip cookies, but I need to know where the ingredients is coming from. So I even, I even mill my own flour. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, enough of that. So, um, Raw egg are not, yeah, can be raw eggs for dogs, but um, so farm fresh eggs for dogs. And I, I'm talking like, you know, go to a farm and get them. There's lots of people now. If you don't have chickens of your own, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty easy now to find someone who does have chickens that you can buy eggs from. Um, and if you can't, for whatever the reason, if you're buying them in the store, you need to really look for that organic label. All right. Cage free, free range, all that. They're marketing terms, folks. They really are. And they're not exactly what you think they are. Um, I know of a chicken facility, not terribly far from me, and they label their eggs as cage free. And when I tell you these chickens are shoved in these buildings, just walking around, walking all over each other, dying, dying from disease. They're in fecal matter and all kinds of stuff. They're literally getting trampled to death because there's so many in this tiny, not tiny space, but so many in this space that there's no room for them to move. That is considered cage free and it's horrible. It's barbaric and it's awful. And those chickens are producing so much cortisol because they're so stressed and then you're ingesting that. They're not healthy eggs. So try to find a local source if you can't have chickens yourself. And if you end up getting them at the store, you don't have a farmer's market near you or anything like that, make sure they're organic. Okay. All right. So for you and your dog, you want to look for that. All right, moving on again. I'm not opposed to raw. <clears throat> it's not my thing. Um, some some food that the Woody's Place dogs get is raw. It's usually fruits or vegetables, but um, just not like a, I don't want to cook raw. Or, uh, not cook raw. I didn't mean that. I didn't want to serve them raw. I'm, I just don't. I'm not, 
just not okay with it for whatever the reason. I'm trying to get there. I, I see a lot of nutritional benefits from raw, but I'm just not there yet. <laughs> um, I cook for the Woody's Place dogs low and slow. So you don't want to... You don't want to cook at a high temperature at a quick rate because then you're you're cooking the nutrients right out of the um, the food, the real food for the dogs, which is exactly what happens with kibble. So you don't want to do that. So low and slow. Um, I have an instant pot. I also have a um, <clears throat> cast iron Dutch oven, and typically I'll start out in the morning or, you know, mid-morning, um, putting together whatever food it is that I have for the dogs. And I put it in the Instant Pot or the cast iron Dutch oven and um, start cooking it at a slow um, rate, low temperature. All right. So by the time dinner time rolls around, it's probably been cooking, you know, six, seven hours. Um, it's all good to go. And I know what's in there is 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 healthy for them all the all the nutrients are there that i um set out to give them when i when i started the journey um that's not to say that there aren't times that i don't have time to do that so i will cook their dinner um in a cast iron skillet on my stovetop um it's still usually at a a lower temperature um I don't do like high. I rarely ever even do medium high. It's typically like low, medium or medium and just allow, you know, a little more time to 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 cook the food for them. Uh, now, as far as actually serving it to the dogs, um, they can smell every ingredient that I, I put in the recipe for them. Like everyone. Savvy. She's like off to my left right here. Um, this morning I put apples in their food and I cut them up like teeny tiny. Like I was trying to give them to like a toddler or something. <laughs> Honest to God, she ate around every little teeny tiny apple sliver in her bowl. And then of course, Brutus ran over and ate all of her apples, but she doesn't like apples and she can pick them all out. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a dog like that, that's a picky eater, I would recommend getting a food processor. You can get a pretty decent food processor for, you know, $50, $60 on, um, Amazon or something along those lines. I mean, obviously they're really good food processors that cost a lot more, but if you're just talking about making your dog's food, um, just buy a food processor around $50, $60 online. And um, when you're done cooking all the ingredients, uh, just blend it up in the in the food processor. Even if you don't want to buy a food processor, some blenders are, are really good, you know, or even like a, what's it called? Nutribullet, something along those lines and just process it up. So it looks like a mush or something along those lines, and then your dog can't pick out the ingredients they don't like. <laughs> and they probably won't notice at that point. Um, I also do that for dogs like uh, Brandy. Um, you know, as you know, she just passed away not too long ago, but she was geriatric and just having a real difficult time eating. Um, <clears throat> it was literally spoon feeding her, you know, like, I don't know, maybe the last three weeks, four weeks of her life. Um, and I would have to mash up her food pretty well to like a, an oatmeal consistency to get her to eat it, eat it. So you can do that with home cooked, no problem. And like I said, they, they typically love it. Otherwise, just cooking it, <laughs> you know, like slicing it, cubing it whatever. It's, it's all good. I, I don't ever just give like a slab of chicken in their bowls or anything like that. I typically, you know, um, portion it out somehow. Um, all right. So introducing the food and serving it appropriately, like the, the portions and stuff like that. Okay. So if you're feeding your dog kibble, you don't want to just take them off the kibble real quick and switch them over to the home cooked, although I'm sure they would absolutely love it. You don't want to do that. You got to introduce it slowly. Okay. So, you know, start out, start out with like, instead of um, doing 100% kibble, start out with like 75% kibble, 25% home cooked, and then slowly start decreasing the kibble while increasing the home cooked. Over like 
I'm going to say like, you know, seven to 10 days. That that sounds like a safe um, amount of time because you just don't want them to have like, <clears throat> you know, some sort of adverse effect from it, like an upset belly or GI upset or something along those lines. Like it's kind of like when you switch a different brand of food, like commercial brand food, you know, you do it gradually. You don't just, you know, you know, just get rid of one bag of kibble and start them on another brand of kibble. It's, it should be, it should be done slowly. So I'm going to say over seven to 10 days is a safe amount of time. Decrease the kibble while increasing the home cooked and keep an eye out for any sort of issues like a GI upset or licking of paws or scratching of ears or something along those lines. And then you'll know, um, hey, this is what I changed. So it's got to be that. It's got to be the home cook. Now, that leads me to the next thing. You want to stick with one protein source. Okay. I stick with one protein source for about two weeks. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, that is not a Woody's Place dog. I don't know if you're hearing that. It's not a Woody's Place dog. Unfortunately, it's it's a dog here that lives the next property over. And I feel bad because it's, it's a hunting dog and it's outside all the time. It's has shelter. Uh, but that's it. Can't do anything else about it. And it's pretty sad. Uh, anyway. Um, okay. So start out with one protein source, all right? Whether it be chicken, beef, turkey, venison, buffalo, whatever it is, one protein source. I'm going to say for two weeks. That sounds good to me. Again, not, not two weeks, maybe seven to 10 days. Um, <clears throat> see if there's any sort of reaction. All right. Again, you're looking for some GI upset, some like allergic response or something along those lines. And if if there is something like that, you need to eliminate um, the protein source. So actually, it would be a protein source, a complex carbohydrate and a fat. But stick with whatever you're making, stick with that for seven to 10 days to see if there's any sort of allergic reaction. After seven to 10 days, you can switch to a different protein source. So if you're doing chicken, you can switch to beef, but keep the complex carbohydrates and the fat the same. All right. So this way, if there is an allergic response, then you know it's the protein source. Once you're good with two different protein sources like chicken or beef, then you can start fiddling around with different complex carbohydrates. Like if you were doing, um, <clears throat> if you were doing spinach, you can try broccoli now, or you can add quinoa if you'd like, or you can add asparagus or something like that. But it's just like if you're a mom, it's just like when you you had a baby and you start slowly introducing new foods and sticking with those foods for a little bit of time to see if there's any sort of reaction. All right. Again, this is to help you ward off any sort of allergies and, you know, throw your dog out of whack with itching and, and paw licking and all that stuff. Okay. So, um, within a month's time, you should be able to have two two different recipes with two different proteins and a couple of different carbo uh, complex carbohydrates and fats, all right? And you maybe want to keep a journal of, of all this. And, you know, like I said, if there's some sort of reaction, you could say, oh, I gave, I gave Atticus beef on May 10th. And by May 15th, he was chewing on his paws and he wasn't doing that before, <laughs> you know, so this way, you know, because life happens and, you know, you may forget. Okay. So introduce slowly, wait to see if there's a reaction. Okay. But the goal is to be incorporating healthy whole foods into your dog's diet while decreasing the kibble and then be able to rotate different healthy ingredients and have and have knowledge of what works and what doesn't. So <clears throat> after you get your dog off the kibble, how much how much whole cook uh, how much home cooked whole food do you feed your dog? It depends. It depends on your your dog's um, body weight, all right? But um, <clears throat> you want to try to do um, two to three percent of your dog's body weight. That's that's ideal right there. So, um, 
So for every 15, I'm sorry, for every 50 pounds, you want to do like 16 ounces, okay, or two cups. So if your dog's 15 or 50 pounds, 16 ounces, you can give them a cup in the morning and a cup in the evening. If your dog's 100 pounds, you're going to double that. So it would be two cups in the morning and two cups in the evening of, of whole um, home cooked whole food. And then what you want to do is you want to, you want to watch, you want to watch, um, to see if they're gaining weight, if they're losing weight, you want to look at their ribs, you know, like their waistline. If they start to plump out, obviously, you know, to cut back. If they're getting too thin, you want to add more. Um, if you have an active dog, you know, maybe it won't be enough, that guideline right there. So you might need to add more. Um, if you have an inactive dog, that's a hundred pounds and you're feeding them four cups a day, but now they're kind of, you know, looking like a potato, you need to cut back, right? So it's a little bit of eyeballing there and a, a watch and wait, see, see kind of thing. And again, you're going for the 60% protein, 10% of which is organ meat, um, the 10% healthy fat, 30% carbo, uh, complex carbohydrates. And I need to back up a second here because you, you, you need to measure all of that by weight and not volume. Okay. So that's, that's an important factor that I kind of left out in the beginning. All right. So let me cover real quick, um, foods, stuff that you need to avoid in, um, in, in the ingredients for your dog's home cooked whole food, no alcohol. Okay. That's, that's, the gimme, no alcohol, no caffeine, all right? No chocolate, um, grapes, that's a big no-no. Um, kale and cruciferous vegetables in large amounts. Now, you can, you can do kale. Kale is actually good for dogs, but only in small amounts. Same with cruciferous vegetables, only in small amounts. Uh, cruciferous vegetables could, you know, cause some GI upset, excess, um, gas and in bigger dogs, especially like German shepherds, it could lead to bloat. So that's fine. Kale, cruciferous vegetables are fine, but only in small amounts. Okay. Um, la, 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 la. Let's see. Raisins. That's another one. That's a no-no. Uh, macadamia nuts are not good for dogs. Uh, cow's milk, not good for dogs. However, cow dairy in small amounts can be okay. And I'm talking like um, yogurt. Uh, like Greek yogurt, really, um, and um, kefir. That's another thing that, you know, could actually be, it actually has um, nutritional benefits, the probiotics for dogs, but in small amounts. I'm talking like maybe just like a tablespoon or something in the dog's food or something along those lines is, is actually fine. Just like a dollop, not a whole lot. <laughs> um, so that's, that's fine. Uh, onions, no. Garlic. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> garlic. Oh yeah. Um garlic, raw garlic is not bad for dogs, okay? It is not bad for for dogs, just like avocado. Um dogs can have some avocado. So so somehow this information got out there and it got misconstrued and then all of a sudden, you know, things like garlic, I'm talking raw garlic, and avocado were listed as taboo, and it's not true. It's not true. But again, this needs to be done in moderation. Garlic is fine for dogs as long as it's raw garlic, okay? You're not giving them garlic powder, minced garlic, or, you know, whatever. It needs to be like garlic cloves, okay? And so for a German Shepherd-sized dog, 70 to 90 pounds or whatever, within that that weight class right there, um, that dog can have approximately two and a half cloves of garlic every so often in moderation. You're not going to give it to them every day. You're not going to give it to them at every meal, but every so often they can have it, all right? But it has to be raw garlic clove. 70, 90 pound dog, it's typical size of a German Shepherd, no more than two and a half cloves. Um Let's see what else. Let me just look at my notes here. Chives. That's another thing that aren't really good for for uh, for our dogs. Uh, salt in large amount. That's a big no no. However, our dogs do need salt, so it would be some salt, just a little bit of salt, and it should be sea salt. All right. So not like the 
Ox, the, uh, I don't want to say the brand name, but, you know, it's a brand name. It comes in a blue container and it's in the grocery store and it's got a little girl with an umbrella on the, <laughs> on the, the container. You don't want, you don't want that regular salt. It should be sea salt. Uh, xylitol. That's another thing that, that could be found in gum. It could be found in like sugar free items such as peanut butter. So stay away from that. Um, some bones are not good for dogs, obviously like cooked chicken bones or something along those lines. So it's best to stay away from that fatty processed meats. I think I talked about this a little bit in the beginning, you know, lunch meats, bolognese, salamis, pepperoni, stuff like that. Um, fatty pork, like ham and bacon, not good, you know, pork roll. So avoid those things in your dog's meal. Okay, getting back to the protein, it should be as lean as possible. It should be hormone-free, antibiotic-free. Um, hopefully, you know about the farm. The animals should have been treated, um, raised and treated with care and compassion, um, not like factory farming or anything along those lines. All right, just odds and ends here. A couple things to remember. Um, I wrote them down. Just remember to rotate your ingredients, right? After you've gotten those that first month down, you've gotten two recipes together, um, and you start adding on, you start building on to that, you need to remember to rotate ingredients so your dog is having all of their macro and micronutrients met, all right? That's important. That is key right there to rotate ingredients. Again, just like us, just like our kids, we don't eat the same thing over and over, and neither should our dogs, right? It's mix it up a little bit. Um, pay attention to your dog's body. If they're looking like they're too thin, you need to you need to give them more. If they look like they're you know becoming a potato, you need to cut back. Um, every meal does not have to be perfectly balanced, but it should balance out within a week's time. Okay, it's it's really good to keep a journal and of what you're doing, what you're feeding your dog, and how much. Cook low and slow, all right? We want those nutrients to remain intact. We don't want to cook them out of what it is that we're serving our dogs, so low and slow. Calcium, so that's an important one. Calcium should be about 500 milligrams per pound of meat, okay? Um, <clears throat> and you want to do this for every meal. And the calcium to phosphorus ratio, ratio is 1.2 to 1. Okay, so 1.2 calcium, 1 phosphorus. They go hand in hand. Vitamin D3, that's another important one. We want 225 international units per pound of food every meal. And it's best to get this from the food itself, right? Um, but cod liver oil, that's, that's, um, that's another good source too for... Um, for vitamin D3. Sorry, my throat's getting dry here. <laughs> uh, vitamin E, that's another one. 100 international units uh, per every 30 pounds of body weight every day. Um, trace minerals, all right? That's something I didn't even talk about, but I will be talking about this in my nutrition course. Uh, great sources of trace minerals for dogs are spir spirulina, <laughs> kelp, mussel, Mussels, like, you know, that come from the ocean. That's fantastic. Bone meal, beans, molasses, blackstrap molasses, fish, and organ meat, uh, and muscle meat, too. So, um, and you can add, so, like, if you're, if you're not sure if your dog is having its um, nutritional needs met, first of all, you should be taking your, your dog to the vet um, every six months. Um, get their blood checked. Make sure that their nutrients are being met. Okay, that's simple right there. Um, you can add a, a multivitamin to your dog's meal to help balance it out. Um, Dr. Karen Becker, she has a really good one. It's it's called Meal Mix, and it comes in a, in a packet. So the packet comes in a box. I don't know how many. I can't remember how many packets are in the in the box, but basically, you um, just open the packet. And mix it in with your, uh, dump it into your dog's home cooked food and kind of stir it in a little bit. And um, it balances the meal out. 
Um, Dog is Human is another one that has, it's just like a little chew that you could actually put in there. And that, that helps balance things out. Like if you're missing some of some trace minerals or, um, <clears throat> some nutrients like, uh, you know, calcium or something along those lines, those, those, uh, it's like a multivitamin. It helps balance it out. Um, I wouldn't rely too heavily on those though. I would rely, um, on knowledge and making sure that their their nutrients are being met from the whole food, just like us. Again, we take supplements if we have to, but really we want to make sure that our nutrients are being met from the food that we eat. All right. It's almost an hour. <laughs> I'm, I'm spent. I hope this helps you. If you have any questions, you can certainly um, get in touch with me through uh, this this platform or through our, our email address, wpsgss.org, um, Facebook, Instagram. I'm even, we're even on TikTok now begrudgingly, but we are. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. So I am working on a nutritional uh, course, um, home-cooked whole food nutritional course with recipes uh, for older dogs, um, not just older German shepherds, but older dogs in general. Um, I am a certified canine nutrition, uh, pet nutrition coach. And, um, the course that I, I had taken was race certified. So that is a course that your veterinarian would take. Um, and I got a lot of information out of it and it's something I'm passionate about and I read about it all the time. And, <laughs> And I, I'm doing pretty good here with the Woody's Place residents. So, yeah, I think I think the course is going to be beneficial to you as well. Um, so that's about it. Just want you to know it doesn't have to be a scary thing, right? Cooking for your dog. Just start out small, right? Backing up, just start out small. I, I say this all the time. Add an egg to your dog's meal. See how that goes. And if that goes well... Try chicken after that. Just start with one protein source. Start out small. See how that goes. Okay? All right, folks. Um, trying to think. What is up next? Next is um, is treats. Treats for your dogs. Real whole food treats for your dogs. And I'm, I'm going to give you a hint right now. I like single ingredient treats for the Woody's Place dogs here. All right? Okay. Till next time, folks. Be well. Mm-hmm.